Matthew 22, are you there? Open up God's Word this morning. Um, I don't know if I've preached anything like this in a while, but I'm going to preach it this morning. This has everything to do with the gospel. And the gospel is that you can have your sins forgiven, you can have your sins washed away, you can go from being guilty of every wrong thing that you've ever done to being right and justified as if you had never sinned any sin whatsoever. Okay? That's, that's the gospel. It's done by Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. He suffered in our place, took our position, and um, it pleased God to bruise Him, Isaiah said, and it satisfied the just demands of God's law. It's like if, if you committed a crime and they sentenced you to death, if at the last minute it was arranged that somebody else was going to take your place, the governor approved it, and somebody else was going to take your place on the, on the table and receive the sentence of death for you so that you could live and go free. I don't know if that's ever been done in American history, I know there's nothing, there's nothing in the law that says it can't be done. Um, I know that if somebody gets in a little legal trouble and they need help paying fines, anybody in the world can pay that person fines and get them out of that trouble. There's no law against it. But in God's courtroom, Christ satisfied the demands of the law that somebody had to die. And that somebody was Jesus Christ instead of us. Amen? Now, one of two things is going to happen in your and my lifetime. We're either going to see Jesus appear in the clouds and we're going to be received up to him or his, his people are going to be received up to him or we're going to die. And the thing is, we don't know the day of either one. I did not know. And my sister called me that morning and said, Mike, meet us at the emergency room. They're taking Dad over there. He's not, he's not feeling well. That ain't the first time I'd been called to the hospital to go and visit my dad. I did not know that he was going to breathe his last breath that day. I did not know that. There's been several other people that I've witnessed their death. I've been there with them. I did not know that that day they were going to draw their last breath. But sure as I'm standing here, everybody in this room is either going to see the Lord's return or you're going to draw your last breath on this earth and then you're going to stand before God. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? When I was young, and me and Melissa would be in some kind of nonsense and meanness, Mom would tell us, get our rooms cleaned, She'd be home in three hours. I would wait two hours, 58 minutes. And one time she surprised me. She lied. She came in early. And I was not ready. Okay? It's going to be worse than that if you're not ready much worse. Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. You, you get who that is, don't you? The marriage, that son is Christ. Sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would, and they would not come. 
Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Let me stop right here while I'm thinking about it. My hope in life is that on the day that God gets ready is the same day that I'm ready. That's my hope. But since I do not know when the day is coming that God's going to be ready, then it is my responsibility to be ready today, tomorrow, this whole week. There's a song in our hymn books that says, Will Jesus find us? Watching. And that comes from the Bible because Jesus said, Watch and be ye ready. Uh, he said, I, All things are ready. So the master, the king, has everything ready. And he's bidding his, his friends and his people to come to the wedding and they are refusing. He said, But I'm ready. Let's, we're, having the, we're having the wedding now. Come unto the marriage. Verse 5, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. This is a prophecy of, the, of what's going to happen in the last days. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered all as many as they found, both bad and good. Think about that. You're either in one of the two categories. You're either in the good category or the bad category. And I would say that we're probably all in the bad category. And the wedding was furnished with guests. God's going to have somebody sitting at his table on wedding day. Who will it be? Who will it be? In uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 18, the Lord instructs Abraham what he's going to do. He said, I'm going to destroy Sodom for their wickedness. Abraham pleads with God and says, if you, know, you can find 50 righteous people, will you not do it? And God said, for 50 righteous people, I won't destroy them. Then he, but there wasn't 50 people in Sodom that was righteous. And he worked his way down to, I think, 10 and then five, but there wasn't that many in Sodom that was righteous. So Abraham knew that God was going to destroy Sodom. Abraham knew it. Then the two angels, they went to Sodom and they told Lot, you need to leave your house and take all your family with you because we're going to destroy this town. And Lot pleaded with his sons-in-law that they would go, but they wouldn't. They scoffed, they laughed. They said, it's, well, I'm not worried about that. And so they stayed. If you remember, literally the angel grabbed Lot by his arm, grabbed his two daughters, grabbed his wife, and they said, we're leaving because we have to destroy this city and we can't destroy it with you in it. So they literally pulled them out. Lot's wife, of course, turned back around, looked back at Sodom, God turned her into a pillar of salt. She was in the process of leaving, but her heart was not ready. You can be in this church today or watching online and your heart not be ready. Because Lot left everything behind. And are you willing to leave everything and everybody behind. Are you willing to leave? 
family? Are you willing to leave possessions? Are you willing to leave country? Are you willing to leave the home that you live in? Are you willing to leave the status that you have with people? Are you willing to leave everything behind and be saved? That's, that's a powerful message. Because I'm afraid what's being preached in too many churches is... You can be saved, but then keep everything in this world, and that's not how it works. They left it all. But the point is, is that Lot knew it. His two daughters that were saved knew it. And the people of Sodom didn't know it. But they were about to draw their last final breath on that day. And God literally consumed that entire city with fire, brimstone, which is sulfur. And if you know anything about sulfur, it burns very, very hot. It literally turned that entire city, the Bible says, to ashes. There was none of it left. Scholars are not even sure where Sodom even exists to this day because there's very little evidence left that that city even existed. But I believe it did. Those people didn't know that they were about to draw their last breath. I wonder, I wonder who in here might draw their last breath this week. I wonder who, if there's anybody here that they're going to have to go meet God this week. I don't know that. And neither do you. Is it possible? I wonder if the people watching online, maybe those in Kenya. I wonder if any of those who would be watching, they're going to draw their last breath this week. We had a family here uh, a few weeks ago, a woman and her three daughters, you remember them? They were from Holland. They were from the Netherlands. Okay? Their daughters, they were, they just, they were everybody's friends today on Sunday. Okay? Their, her husband got on his motorcycle one day and never came back home. He left this world and went and stood before God. Now, he was one of our faithful watchers. He was watching every Sunday. And I believe that he was ready to go meet God. But who is listening to me today that this week you're going to draw your last breath and you don't know it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The Father in heaven, I ask God that you help me minister and preach this message. I ask, Father, Lord, for your grace. Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd make the devil go out, sit outside while we have church, while you deal with hearts. And Father, let there not be any distractions. Let every heart be grave, be sober-minded this morning as we consider where we stand with you. Lord, I don't know. I do not know, Lord who I'm preaching to. But God, I know you gave me this message. Father, whoever it reaches, that's who it reaches. Whoever you speak to, that's who we're speaking to today. And I just pray your Holy Spirit will guide somebody today who, if they were to be honest and admit, they're not sure if they're ready to meet you. Father, have your way in this message. Bless this church. Bless those that are watching online. Lord, we love them all. We thank you, Lord, for helping us, dear God, to reach out to so many people. Use us now for your kingdom and your glory's sake. In your name's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I got a lot of scriptures to give you. I'm going to try to move through them. In fact, I, I probably just won't have much else to say other than what the Bible is going to say. Matthew 24, verse 36. If you know anything about Matthew and Matthew 24, you know that Jesus talks about his coming. 
the day that he's going to appear in the clouds, and the trumpet's going to sound, he's going to gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other, and he's going to save his elect, and then he's going to pour out his wrath upon the rest of the world. And in Matthew 24, verse 36, the Bible says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. How true is that? I mean, unless, unless you're on death row, and you're under sentence of death, and they have scheduled your death to be at a certain time, six minutes after midnight, they're going to give you the lethal injection or whatever, I think they ought to bring back hanging in the town square, I send a message out there. This is what happens to people who break the law. But they probably won't do that because I said so. But there's people on death row that probably know when they're going to die. And I knew an old preacher that ministered down here at uh, one of the prisons down here down south. And they had a, they had a death row. They had a, that's where they did executions. I think it's down here at Potosi or somewhere. And he would go down there and witness to men that were on death row and try to lead them to the Lord. And with some, with some, it, it, it went pretty well. He would tell me, he said, Mike, you hear about that guy? He said, I led him to the Lord a few weeks before he died. He was saved before he was killed. Who in here remembers Jeffrey Dahmer? Remember that guy? He was murdered while he was in prison. But did you know that a preacher went to visit him and led him to the Lord? Jeffrey Dahmer, mean, uh, he was a people eater, wasn't he? Sick, but he's in heaven. But he said, Mike, there's guys down there that are so hard and so vicious, they curse God. And they will curse God on the day that they draw their last breath. God has a place for them in hell right next to you if you're not ready. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then, two shall, be, then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. Turn your Bible back to Genesis chapter 6, since he referenced the days of Noah. On the day that God began to flood the earth, people were, had, had refused what they had heard. Maybe they saw the testimony. Maybe they saw Noah and his sons building that ark. Maybe they saw that. Maybe they inquired. Maybe they heard Moses talk about it down at the lumber yard where he was buying uh, wood. Maybe they, maybe they knew Moses and they, they went to talk to him to Moses, why are you doing this? And he told them, God's going to destroy this earth. There's plenty of room on here. And if not, then I can make it bigger maybe, but there's room now on the ark. Why don't you come with me? And for 120 years, the Bible says, God's spirit strove with man over that issue. And it was only Noah, his three sons, their wives, and Noah's wife. And that was it. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and yet his day shall be in 120 years. So let's say that for 120 years, let's say that God said this to mankind, and all mankind knew that they had 120 years. So what do we do with 120 years? We waste 119 of it. Amen? In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord said unto Noah, Come down all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. 
And then he says in verse 4, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And you know, I just, I just saw something in this verse I've never really paid attention to before, but I think it fits today. I think I see something now. God said, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. You see, the problem that we have now, and it's even a problem in a lot of churches, is that we don't believe the Bible, or people don't believe the Bible anymore when it comes to the creation of the world. They don't believe that God made the universe in six days. They don't believe that God created every living thing that was on the earth. And it was, it was God. If God created it, if God wanted to destroy it, it was His. And what, what the problem is, nobody believes the gospel because people don't believe that God created them. They don't believe God anymore. They don't believe in God anymore. Nobody believes in the Creator. Therefore, we can live our lives how we want to live our lives, do what we want to do, and not be held accountable. That is this generation. And it doesn't matter if you give them 120 days, or as God said here in, in uh, verse 4, God gave them seven days. And that door of the ark stayed open for seven days. But now, on the, on the day that God said this for yet seven days, Noah and his family went into the ark. They went into the ark, and they stayed there for seven days. And the door to that ark was open. God being merciful to people. God giving them every opportunity Charles Manson's dead and in hell. He was given opportunity, but he went around telling his cult members that he was Jesus Christ. Man's sick. The problem is, you will be standing next to Charles Manson if you're not ready. Charles Manson, Adolf Hitler, all these other wicked people. If you're not ready, you're going to the same place that they're going. And you can play church and be religious and attend service and you can be like Lot's wife. Yes, we're leaving, but then turn around desiring what it is that you're losing and never make it. Turn to Matthew 24 again. Matthew 24. Verse 42. Watch therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also what? What is that word? Ready. I'm not kidding you. I woke up yesterday morning I woke up about four times, I think. <laughs> Kept going back to sleep. One of the times when I woke up, I'm not kidding you, God put this word in my heart, the word ready, and said, preach that. And I, I got what he was saying. Are, are you ready? Therefore, verse 44, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And I've been asked this question, you know, by preachers for years. When Jesus 
comes for you, what will you be doing? I would hate to think that the day I decided to sneak into a bar and drink something would be the day that Jesus appeared in the clouds. Right? I mean, I've been preached at all my life. That would be the day. That would be my luck. The day that I decided to go into a bar and drink something with the rest of the guys. Now, how is it you do that? You put your arm up here and you drink like this. Eat the peanuts, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a bar guy. I don't know how to do this. But the day that I would choose to do that, there would be trumpets sounding and people rising in the air. And I'm going, I picked the wrong day to do this. I see, that kind of comical, but the truth of it is, We've got things in us that if we did them, it wouldn't be the first time. Can you hear it? Amen? Wouldn't be the first time. I would hate, I would hate to not be found ready by my Lord when he called. Blessed is that servant. Verse 47, Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. I mean, surely he was supposed to be here at Y2K, wasn't he? He missed y 2 He missed... 1988, because there was a book that came out, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. You remember that? He missed 88. He missed Y2K. He missed the Maya calendar 2012. And he's missed every YouTube prediction since then. And there's been a hundred of them. So you know what all that stuff does? It does with people who are already lost. They've heard all of this junk before, and when we try to testify to them of the truth of the Lord's coming, they laugh and they say, you guys have been predicting that for years and it's never come. This is why these people on YouTube tick me off. Because they're running people away from the gospel by giving their lying predictions. My Lord delayeth his coming, shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did you look at what your Bible said? He's not talking about unchurched people. He's talking about church people. Church people who say, I've heard all those predictions, all that Bible prophecy stuff. I'm about sick of that. I'm just going to go and have my best life now. God said, I'm going to appoint him his portion with the hypocrite. You know what the hypocrites are, don't you? The hypocrites are the church members who weren't ready. Second Peter chapter three, turn there. Second Peter chapter three, verse three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. What is it that's guiding their theology? Lust. Lust will keep you from believing in God. Lust will keep you from believing that God is your creator and he brought you into this earth and he has the right at any time to recall you and cause you to stand before him. If a judge sends out an officer of the court with a letter and in that letter is a summons to appear in court on such and such day, what, are, what should you do? 
you should go to court. But what do a lot of people do? Run! I'm not showing up! And then hope to God that they never get pulled over. Amen? And lo and behold, their blinker light's going to go out one day and a cop's going to pull them over and find out they've got a warrant. They're going to have to stand before that judge whether they want to or not. That's just the earthly court. Do you think God's any less than that? When God gets ready to call your name, you're going to stand before God, whether you want to or not. Whether your lust allowed it or not, you're going. So they're going to walk after their own lust in verse 4, and they're going to say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, he's talking about the flood, uh, being overflowed with water, perished. God's already judged this world once, and he's going to do it again. Because it's worse now than it was then. The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years has one day. And I've taught on that before, not going to deal with that this morning. He said, the Lord is not, watch this now, you listen to this. The Lord is not slack concerning His Promise. You know what that means? You know what slack is, don't you? It's a rope. Where if a rope's tight, it's strict and rigid. But, oh, God's going to give me a little slack. That's what people think. God's going to cut me a little. I, I, get, I get to sin. And God always cuts me a little slack with it. And God hasn't got me for it. So I guess that means I can go and do whatever I want. See, if, you, if a child gets away with it one time, what are they going to do? Do it again. Worse. And so you think that because God let you get away with it once, and He didn't just strike you down right then, that you can go do it again, only worse. Because you think God is slack. I'm going to tell you something. He's not. The fact that you're doing something and getting away with it. You know what that tells me? That in Hebrews 12 terms, you're a bastard. Because God is not chastening you as his son. And you're going to get away with it until God calls your name and you go stand before him in judgment. I would rather take a beating from God every day than to suffer hell. Because the beatings of God cease. Hell doesn't. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter three ten, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are in that shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? God's going to burn everything of yours up. You're going to lose it all. But you'll gain heaven. So how then should you live your life between now and the day that God decides that you're going to stand before him? How should you live this life? He said, in holy conversation and godliness. That means don't think in your mind, well, I mean, I think the Lord's going to give us six more months. I'm going to spend five and a half months sinning. In the last ten days, I'll get right with God. That's how some people, that's how some people live their lives and do this thing. Stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. The Bible promises you in such an hour as you think not. 
is coming. Matthew 25, turn there. Boy, I told you I was just going to give you scripture. That's pretty much what I'm doing. You should be, as I'm preaching this, you should be asking yourself, am I ready? You should be asking yourself, what sins am I holding back? that I've committed, that I'm guilty of, that I haven't repented of? What sins do I have in my life? That's what you should be asking. Matthew 25, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. You see, it's the religious crowd he's talking to here. They got lamps, right? You know, the, you know, the lamp, what's the lamp, John? What's the lamp? We all got Bibles, amen? Oh, we got the King James Bible. You know what the oil is? You read it. You read it. Reading of God's Word replaces all that nonsense you want to get into. Reading God's Word causes you to want to live a holy, clean life. Reading God's Word causes you to want to be as far away from your sin as you possibly can. So, some people are just wise that way. They don't think that they can just go do whatever they want to do. And hang on to sin. And try to play games with God. Maybe I'll get, if I get it right at the right day, then maybe I'll make it. You're a fool. You have a lamp and no oil in it. So, um, the verse 3, they, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels and their, with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. See, that again, according to everybody's calculations, Jesus should have already been back here by now. But it didn't quite work out the way the scholars and the map makers had all figured out. So, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of you oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Think about it. What if, what if the Lord came in two minutes from now, and called up people out of this church. And you were still sitting here. Those that left are not going to turn around and say, we'll help you. They can't. It's already over with. Verse 11 or verse 10, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. No more. Who in here has heard that, well, after the rapture, uh, they're telling us that people can be saved after the rapture happens, and we'll get to be saved after the... Who in here has heard that? Who in here believes that? I don't. I think God's going to shut the door. Period. And afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You don't know the day. You don't know the hour. I don't. God when I first studied prophecy, God took me away from trying to figure out the day and the hour. Mike, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. It'll be in my time, and I'll do it my way, in my hour, and my day. And I said, God, you're right. It's not my responsibility to figure out for you what day it's going to happen. That's on you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, turn there. 
Boy, God's, God's preaching this well, isn't He? God's preaching this well. All these Bible verses, that's God trying to ring it into your heart. What He's saying is true. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, that's you who aren't ready. You who aren't ready are going to say, well, I feel at peace. I read Joyce Myers and I, I just feel good about myself now. I love myself. That's you. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Where's our ladies that had that happen? Where travail just went boom! Amen? With, with Lindsay, it was, we was already at the hospital, but with Alicia, me and Lisa was sitting in the living room watching Roseanne Barr. I don't watch her now. God convicted me of that. But we were watching Roseanne, and all of a sudden Lisa jumped up! And I said, what's the matter? Don't! She went running off, and I went, oh, that's the matter. And you should have seen me drive like a jet plane. An hour-long trip took me 30 minutes. And Lisa would say, slow down! And then she would go, ah! And I'd say, I'm not having a baby in this car! It's not paid for yet! When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman and a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night, neither of, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You can go to sleep if you want. You can go to sleep with your life full of sin, your life full of, full of rebellion, your life full of wastefulness, your life full of, of your own ways, thinking, well, God's got everything covered in me by grace. I don't have to worry about anything. That's not what the Bible told you to do. The Bible told you to watch and be sober. Do you think being sober means don't have a Bud Light in your hand all the time? It's exactly what it means. Tells you to watch. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober and putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm preaching this message to somebody. I don't know who it is. God gave it to me. God told me to preach it. And it's being preached to somebody. I have no idea who it is. But let's just say that God is so loving and long-suffering and kind that He's giving you another chance to not go to hell. Amen? I mean, you're, you're the ones listening, right? It's not all these people driving up down... Uh, the American Legion drive out here. It's not all the people headed over to Walmart down here. It's not all the people in everybody else's neighborhoods where you're watching online. You're the ones that it's being preached to. I don't need to know who it is, but it's being preached to somebody. God is giving you one more opportunity to get that sin out of your life. Yield your heart and your life over to the Lord Jesus. Calling on Him to be your Savior and your Lord. Forsaking this world. And now you're ready to watch and be sober with the rest of God's people. So, bow your head.